very exciting to be here. My only role is really as timekeeper, but I get to introduce our first three participants. Are you ready for your introduction? Okay, so the, our first session is titled Processes of Cultural Commodification, Selling What, To Whom, and Why. And our first speaker is Dr. Susan Rowley, who actually is a colleague of mine at UBC. So Dr. Rowley is the Curator of Public Archaeology at the Museum of Anthropology and an Associate Professor of Anthropology at UBC. Her research interests include public and Arctic archaeology, oral history, and repatriation. She's going to be speaking um, on a paper entitled, Ookpik, the Ogling Owl at 50. So thank you for starting us off, Dr. Rowley. Thank you. So uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Victor, for your words of welcome. And also, I'd like to say thanks to Musqueam. I've lived on Musqueam ancestral and ceded territory since 2001. It's been a real pleasure, and I cherish the way that Musqueam pushes me to think about things in a new way. I'd also like to thank the Inuit community members that I've had pleasures of working with uh, since the 1980s, and my colleagues at the museum, George and I Pinch, for allowing me to be part of this great project, and Solen for organizing our workshop today. And we're going to kick off with a little bit of serious fluff. We uh, needed a symbol. We needed a mascot for the Canadian Trade Fair in Philadelphia last November, and Utpik was the answer. We found them, actually, in a catalog of Eskimo art put out by the Department of Northern Affairs. We had started our publicity in Philadelphia, and uh, we began to get some response from uh, the press. Uh, we then discovered that while Northern Affairs did have in their warehouse hundreds of uh, uh, very beautiful little sealskin dolls made by the Eskimos, uh, the Arctic Owl, the Ukbik, had uh, actually uh, been sold uh, some time earlier, and there wasn't one available. What happened was this. Uh, when we found there were no Ukbiks available in the Northern Affairs warehouse here in Ottawa, uh, we began to look for Ukbiks. Uh, they got in touch with their people in the north, Fort Chimo, discovered there were no Ukbiks in Ukbik land either, and uh, uh, what is more important, uh, there were no sealskins. About a week before the trade fair opened in Philadelphia, before Canada Week began, uh, a silver jar sealskin was found. Uh, the next question was to have a new pick made. Uh, Northern Affairs fortunately found an Eskimo woman living in Ottawa who could make a new pick, uh, and she did. Saturday night in Philadelphia, when we got the phone call that he was being, he would be arriving Sunday, the night before the fair, but there was something wrong with him. We didn't know what to expect. Well, uh, as it turns out, the Eskimo woman who made uh, Utpik uh, got a little gay or took a little creative license uh, with him, and uh, as a matter of fact, she's given him a duck's bottom with uh, a little tiny web duck's feet at the back. In connection with this Canada Week, which consisted uh, of a, a very large Canadian trade fair with 110 Canadian firms in it, uh, we had down five ships of the Royal Canadian Navy. We decided to amputate the feet and make him new feet. We rushed him out to the dockyards where the uh, fifth escort destroyers were waiting for us. The Navy surgeon was there, of course, because this was a rather important operation. And um, that night at 10.30, we amputated his feet. But 2.30 in the morning, we wondered if uh, we should try amputating his bottom, but after much consultation, we decided not to. And he appeared the next morning at the fair. Psychologically, I think the idea of a government, the Canadian government, uh, using uh, Utpik as a mascot appealed to people. Uh, governments always seem, or often seem, so stuffy, uh, dry, uh, bureaucratic, and so on. Wherever Utpik appears, uh, there's always a headline. And you can use this to advantage in selling Canadian products because you can associate Canadian products with Utpik. 
and immediately there is a favorable reaction. People uh, are associating Canada now with Uppek. Even Uppek has a fan mail. He's receiving about a hundred letters a week from all over the world with requests that he be uh, used in various things, even comic strips. So if you want to watch the rest of that, that's called Eyes on Uppik from, uh, that's available from the CBC online and it's uh, from 1964. So, so where did Uppik come from? Today we'll be looking at this story through his eyes and fortunately for us, Uppik's head can rotate 180 degrees. This is really preliminary archival research, so I haven't had a chance to talk to community members yet. And what I'm doing here today is inviting your advice and assistance on this project. So where did, Uf so, Kujuak Fort Chaimo is home to Ginny Snowball, the Inuit woman who created Ukpik. This settlement was founded as a trading post in 1830 by the Hudson's Bay Company. Okay. And the period beginning with World War II was one of great change and upheaval. During World War II, an American air base uh, was founded uh, at Chimo as part of the, what was called the Crimson Staging Route to take casualties from Europe to hospitals in the United States. And in 1952, a measles epidemic wiped out 10% of the population in the camps in this region. And in 1950s, there was a TB epidemic. It was TB was endemic to the north, up to a third of the population was infected, and up to one in seven Inuit were removed from the north for treatment in southern sanitaria. It's also the time period of the introduction of welfare schooling and movements forced and consensual of people from camps into the settlement. 1949 saw the start of a large-scale market in Inuit carvings from communities to the northwest of Kujuak. This led the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development, referred to throughout this paper as the department, to take a proactive interest in arts and crafts. Government was perhaps more flexible in those days, and Northern Development officers were given wide leeway to explore revenue-generating opportunities with Inuit. The department conducted a survey across southern Canada to discover the types of northern products southern consumers might purchase. Likewise, they financed visits to the United States to discuss placement of Inuit products. For example, in 1960, Don Snowden visited New York City and met with UNICEF about greeting cards, Abercrombie and Fitch about Inuit parkas, the New Amsterdam Fish about Arctic char, Vogue magazine about doing an article about Inuit art, and the Cobra Gallery about ca ca carrying Inuit prints. At the same time, uh, Inuit were not passive. They established a system of cooperatives to break free of the Hudson's Bay Company monopoly on trade and enter the world of commerce on their own terms. The first co-op in Kangarsulwajuk, George River, was founded in 1959, and by 1961 there were four co-ops in northern Quebec, including in Fort Chimo, which was established in 1961. I just want to show this tag briefly. This is a tag from the Pavilnituk uh, co-op. It actually reads, the syllabics read, the people of Pavilnituk in common effort independent. These factors then led to the late 50s and early 60s being a time of great experimentation in Inuit arts and crafts. Some of these were successful and others not so. Ceramics, dolls and tapestries, sealskin animals, clothing. Perhaps the most successful, and the one probably most of you have heard about, are the Cape Dorset prints started in 1959. Ukpik first appeared in a catalogue of Inuit handicrafts in 1962. At the Philadelphia Trade Fair in November 63, orders for Ukpik flooded in. This was entirely unexpected. After all, he was there as a mascot. By the end of the fair, 12,000 Ukpiks had been ordered. How were they going to fill these orders? The task seemed daunting. Inuit and federal government were already aware of issues of commodification, authenticity, and exploitation. In a 1962 article outlining the tag system developed to protect Inuit arts, Don Snowden wrote, some persons actively interested in the well-being of Eskimo people have suggested that the very ingenuity and high degree of creativity and design possessed by Eskimo men and women can lead to success on the market for southern imitators who have at their disposal plants and machinery capable of mass producing variations on original Eskimo creations. This they claim will lead eventually to the complete discouragement of Eskimo craft making. 
To substantiate their argument, they point to the fact one well-known company, he can't name it, but it was the Hudson's Bay Company, with direct access to Eskimo-made dolls of extraordinary appeal, has placed a large order with a manufacturer for simulated Eskimo dolls, complete with attached tag telling the story of the Eskimo child. These same dolls, incidentally, are displayed prominently as Arctic souvenirs in several of the company's own northern posts, an inextricable, inexplicable enigma when the same organization has purchased authentic Eskimo crafts. Given these concerns, discussions were held about how to protect UKPIC. An UKPIC advisory board made up of representatives of the Fort Chimo Co-op, including their lawyers, the firm of Gowling and McTavish, and the department was struck. UKPIC was trademarked, copyrighted, and an industrial design was filed. I haven't yet found the application for UKPIC, but here is the one filed in December of 1964 for UKPIC's friend, Sikusi, designed by eight women from Tuktoyaktuk. The following memo was sent by Art Lang, Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs at the time, referred to in this paper as the minister, to Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson early in 1964. While there is no doubt that the cooperative owns the design of this toy, there is concrete evidence that it is being copied by unauthorized Canadian and foreign firms who are taking advantage of some gaps in the legal safeguards available to the cooperative. This will represent not only a financial loss, possibly a substantial one, to the Eskimo cooperative, but might also leave the federal government vulnerable to criticism for not taking every available step to protect the interest of Eskimo craftsmen against businessmen with whom it is exceedingly difficult for a remote group of Eskimos to compete. It would also prejudice the effective use of UKPIC as a symbol at future trade fairs. I therefore propose to take advantage of Section 9 of the Trademarks Act, which permits the Crown to obtain protection of the name and design. The cooperative would be authorized under subsection 2 of section 9 of the Act to control and benefit from any commercial use of the design. In summary, while reliance on the Trademarks Act in this way is unusual, it seems the best available device to protect the interests of the cooperative in a potentially important economic asset and also to protect the interests of the Crown. The UKPIC Advisory Board also took what I believe is another unusual decision in having UKPIC protected under Article 6 Tur of the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property, an early intellectual property treaty, as an official sign slash hallmark, given his use as a symbol of Canada in trade shows. And this shows that he was later withdrawn, but in 64 he was added to the list. So what I would like to know is, are there other uses by countries to protect an indigenous artistic creation as an official sign and to do this as a means of protecting that community's rights internationally? The UKPIC advisory board was moving fast and having fun while doing it. The announcement of UKPIC's protected status and the licensing of two southern firms to create UKPICs was made at the first UK picnic held at the <laughs> National Press Club on March 4th, 1964. The event was financed by the co-op and the two companies and was a huge success. The day before, as Don Snowden wrote to the minister, this is of course a highly newsworthy event as it represents the first time a group of Eskimos and Canadian industry have signed agreements which will permit industry to use on a royalty basis designs which have originated in the Arctic. It will also be a first-class opportunity for you to point out the way in which industry and the Eskimos can work together to mutual advantage. Licensing agreements were recommended to the UKPIC Advisory Board. They also determined signing fees and royalties. In the heady early days, the signing fee was $1,000 and the royalties 10%. Of these, a percentage went to the creator, Jeannie Snowball. By the end of 1964, 15 groups had been licensed to use Ukpik, everything from jewelry to clothing and songwriters, and a comic strip was syndicated in 30 papers across the nation. The Canadian Handicraft and Fur Manufacturing Limited, a toy licensee, reported sales of more than a quarter of a million dollars in retail, resulting in royalties of 11,600 to the Fort Chimo Co-op. Promotion and licensing continued in 65, but interest in UKPIC was clearly waning. Therefore, the Friends of UKPIC were launched. These failed, unfortunately, to increase UKPIC sales, creating serious concerns over loss of revenue for the Fort Chimo Co-op. This chart shows that decline in revenues. However, a marker year was on the way, the Canadian centennial. And so a determined effort was made to create hype around UKPIC, the Centennial and Expo 67, a major world's fair held in Montreal and coinciding with the Centennial. 
To maximize revenue for Chimo and to produce authentic UKPICs, as many letters to the UKPIC Advisory Board were requesting the proper UKPIC, the Fort Chimo Co-op met and decided to implement a semi-assembly line using die cutting to stamp out UKPIC patterns. 23 people were employed and could produce up to 500 UKPICs a day. By the middle of 67, the department had fronted the cost of amassing 25,000 UKPICs. At Expo, UKPIC was a huge hit at La Ronde, the amusement park, where an authentically Canadian UKPIC mascot interacted with children. In their application to the UKPIC advisory board, the company behind this life figure wrote, the purpose of our project is to have a truly Canadian identity for the children from Canada and the world. We feel very strongly about using Ookpik, as it is probably the only essentially Canadian animal character we have. At the booth selling souvenirs, things were not so happy for our carefully handcrafted, boxed, and tagged friend. While over 50 million people, over twice Canada's population at the time, visited Expo, only 500 Ookpiks were sold. At the inflated Expo stall prices of $7.50 per Ookpik, which is approximately $50 in today's buying power, Ookpik was outside the price range of most children. In fact, the concessionaires had decided long before the fair that Ookpik was too expensive. But this information was never conveyed to the Ookpik Advisory Board. Feathers flew and negative publicity in the CBC ensued. It was clear to all that the Canadian market was saturated. And here's a note from the Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs. We have exhausted the Canadian market, and I think we should go for this, the U.S. market. The main market will be in the U.S. And new markets needed to be developed. However, Ookpik's days as a handcrafted sealskin toy were clearly numbered as another charismatic fauna captured the public's attention. The anti-sealing movement started in 1964 and only gained momentum. By 1968, the average price of a pelt fell from $15 to $2. Stevenson and Burgess wrote, the current price is not enough to pay an Eskimo hunter for his gasoline and ammunition. And while you may be thinking, well, at least that means making an ukpik is less expensive, in fact, the images of blood-soaked ice pans even knowing this wasn't how Inuit hunted seals, and cute seal pups turned people against sealskin products. In the face of growing uncertainty over sealskin ukpiks, the Fort Chimo Co-op recommended the manufacture of ukpiks outside of Canada for the international market. In 1967, they licensed a book and plush ukpik set for the U.S. market, with, ukpik, with the ukpiks in this set manufactured in Japan. So this set was not licensed for sale in Canada. So there is a second act, but my research hasn't reached there yet. What we do know is by the end of the 60s, the ukpik fad was over. Ukpik remains, however, as one of the earliest experiments in indigenous government cooperation in marketing and commodification and in trying to do the right thing. Thank you.